You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs. I have Rabbi Manus Friedman. He's a world-renowned author, counselor, lecturer, and philosopher. Uh, his website is it's good to know dot org i t s g o o d t o k n o w dot org. So we're going to talk about you know Rabbi's work as a rabbi, his YouTube experiences because he puts out a lot of fantastic videos uh, with commentary, and we're going to cover a range of topics. So Rabbi, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. What are we going to be talking about? I love surprises. Uh, well, yeah, we'll talk about many things. Uh, first, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about your history, you know, how you, you came up in the Jewish faith and what made you decide to become a rabbi and you know, maybe a little bit of your, your tenure as a rabbi and then some current issues. How about that? I was educated in a Chabad system. And if you know anything about Chabad, you know that it's all about outreach. It's all about sharing what you know and sharing what you're proud of. So we have centers all over the world called Chabad houses or Chabad centers. And it's outreach to make the world a better place. So as soon as I got married, graduated from yeshiva, I went looking for a place where I could make my contribution. And I ended up in Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh Uh, It worked. It was good. It was great for 51 years. When you first came out to St. Paul, were there any Jews there or was it very sparse? Well, there were 30,000 Jews in the state. Wow. The entire state. But uh, 51 winters. (laughs) <laughs> mm. it's a lot of cold but yeah, was, i've heard it gets down to what like negative sometimes every once in a while negative 80 in uh, minnesota right I've, I've never experienced that far but uh, you know there is there is some warm some global warming because in the first 20 years or 30 years that i was there 30 below was pretty common today it's not we would get piles and piles of snow and we don't get as much snow anymore it seemed to have moved to the northeast now Buffalo gets all the snow. Oh, now you moved to Buffalo? No, now I'm in Brooklyn. Last winter, the whole winter, no snow. Wow. So yeah, that is unusual for New York. Happening. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, what was some of the early work that you did when you first became a, a rabbi? Any notable projects or outreaches that you have good memories of? Yeah, well, one of the first projects we started was a crash course on Judaism for women who didn't have a Jewish education. It was fantastic. The reaction was so strong and so positive. Women all over the world, women from Israel came to St. Paul, Minnesota to study Judaism or a crash course on Judaism. That was an incredible experience. And that lasted 50, it's still going on. That is 50 years old. Why was there no education for women in Judaism? And today, has that been solved or is it still like that? Well, there is education if you start young. You know, you go to grade school, you go to high school, you go to seminary. But for people who hadn't had a Jewish education, and they're now adults, there was no place for them to go, to sit in on, on, on classes with nine-year-olds. That's true. So I can tell you, as an adult and you know, not a avidly practicing Jew, you know, or I call myself sometimes a bad Jew, it is hard to find education. And when I've gone to synagogue a few times, I really wasn't welcomed. So I can see out there there's a lot of forces conspiring to, uh, you know, for people to not reconnect with their heritage once they get older, especially. Well, you know, for a synagogue not to be welcoming is like a contradiction in terms. I experienced it. Maybe I'm mean. I don't know. but (laughs) It, It just shouldn't be that way. Synagogues have to be very inviting. And when you walk in there, you've got to feel at home because a synagogue is a place for Jews. If you walk in, it should feel like it's your place. Maybe that's why we started Chabad centers or Chabad houses, not synagogues. House sounds a little more inviting. Oh, okay. So when you go to a Chabad house, is it is it literally just like a residence? That's a commercial residence? Or what does it look like typically? No, it's usually a commercial looking building because it's, you know, it's for groups of people, but it's very homey. You come there for a meal, you come there for Shabbat, you come there for a holiday. It's much, much more inviting than the formality of a synagogue. Mm, okay. 
Gotcha. The Chabad houses, are they reform? Are they, you know, all across the board? Are they orthodox? What will you typically find there versus, let's say, a Hillel center? Well, you know, we try to keep it Jewish. (laughs) (laughs) It's meant for Jews. It's not meant for orthodoxy or conservatism or reform. It's meant for Jews. So whatever you've you've practiced or whatever temple you belong to or, or pay dues to, if you want to have a really warm, authentic Jewish experience, that's what Chabad House is. It's Judaism for Jews. Okay. Well, how how have you uh, interacted with different, you know, with, I guess, again, Jews that are Reformed, that are conservative, that are Orthodox? Yeah, you know, well, how has it been for you and your interactions with different groups within Judaism? We try to ignore it. A Jew is a Jew, and we don't ask, are you Orthodox, conservative, Reform, atheist, Unitarian? <laughs> we don't ask. Well, that's good. Well, that's excellent. Okay, so you started this women's program. They loved it. It's still going today. Um, any other notable accomplishments or things you've done that just have made you very happy that you've taken this path for so long? Well, the outgrowth of that, you know, if you talk to women for 50 years, you get to know something about relationships because relationships are always a hot topic. And so I put out a few books on relationships that were, did very well. And then when the internet became available and the, high, the information highway, we took advantage of it. And the same things I would teach in Beit Chana in Minnesota, I'm now doing it with a much larger audience, not limited to Jews on the internet. And the reaction is just as enthusiastic and just as great with millions of viewers. And I'm sure they're not all Jewish. I know, I know they're not all Jewish. They're from every country, from every religion, from every culture. People want to hear some, some true wisdom, not some new, newfangled theory or experiment. We've had enough of that. Mm. People are tired of that. They don't trust it anymore. Yeah. A lot of the, uh, the com. you know, I, I was reading news avidly for a while. And then I, would, I went to some alternate news sources and I was struck by one of them. I said, wow, they're just reporting the news. There's no opinion. There's no editorial. It's weird. This is like 30 years ago how they used to report the news. So I, I understand news has become very sensational and it's just opinion and inflammatory stuff. But yours is not. It's very thought provoking and very interesting. It's not a, a social experiment, you know, like the 60s or hippie movement, fads, you know, social fads. Got to get past all of that and talk about things that have always been true, will always be true because they're fundamental. So what has your experience been like, you know, teaching people in the Jewish faith? It's been, like you said, over 50 years, a long time. Have people changed dramatically? How you relate to people, has that changed dramatically? You know, what's your experience of late? My experience is that this notion that human beings are basically inherently decent is actually true. It's actually true. You say what you need to say, you tell, you tell the truth to someone, and their reaction is pure, innocent recognition. You know, right is right, true is true. It's a pleasure to see that. In fact, we recently created a program for inmates in a federal penitentiary in uh, California, teaching the oh, same what, things. What are some of the interesting you know, items that you're teaching the inmates? One of the basic principles is the difference and the distinction between living and existing. We live and we exist. Not the same thing. I can see for inmates, it would be very hard for people to feel like they're living, they're just existing a lot of the time, I guess. No, yeah, you're close. What we're telling them is that being incarcerated severely restricts your existence, but it doesn't touch your life. No one can harm your life. They can only restrict your existence. And existence is depressing in the first place. (laughs) <laughs> to exist means simply to try to stay in existence that's all it means you have to eat to exist you have to sleep to exist you have to drink to exist you need a house you need all your needs are all in order to exist so existing is exhausting it's depressing it's embarrassing i eat today so that i can eat tomorrow it, it it's not something to be proud of at all that's existence life means Does your existence have an impact on the world around you? What are you contributing? Life doesn't demand food or drink or or anything. Life is the constant opportunity to make an impact, to make a difference, to make a contribution. And it turns out, this is what I discovered along the way, 
what is the most important need in a human being? The most important need. It's not what Freud says. Pleasure is not our greatest need. It's not what Adler said. Control and power is not our biggest need. It's not what Maslow says, that we have a hierarchy of needs. None of that is correct. The one and only thing that we need, and we need it badly, is to be purposeful. Mm, makes sense. Seriously depressed if I think my life isn't going anywhere. Why? Why is it so important that my life goes somewhere? Why are we constantly asking, what's the purpose? Why are we here? What are you asking? You're here. You've been here a long time. Settle down. Why do we keep asking, why are you here? You want to go someplace else? You know of any other place? It's a ridiculous question, isn't it? Well, you do see that so many people are craving a purpose. So how do you help them find that? And once they find it, start fulfilling it. Well, first of all, we have to recognize the need for a purpose is the most valid, legitimate need, far more than the need for money, far more than the need for success, far more than the need for love. If parents say to their children, you know, we don't need you. We don't need you. But if you're nice, we'll love you. And then everybody will be happy. No, they won't. A human being does not want to be told you're not necessary, but you're lovable. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. That's good for a gerbil. <laughs> so how, how do people communicate that versus you are necessary, you are important? Like, you know, how do you differentiate again and communicate the right thing to, to someone in your yes. sphere of influence in your family? We've put so much emphasis on love that it's, it's becoming distasteful. Everything is love. The solution to every problem is love. The cause of every problem is a lack of love. So if your kids are unhappy, you have to love them. I do love them. No, you have to love them more. I love them a lot. Not enough. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Love does not make the world go round. In fact, love can be so selfish, so petty, so divisive. We kill for love. It's true. So what a human being really needs is to be needed, not loved. Because I don't need to be loved. I would much rather be needed than be needy. We keep, we keep hearing. Everybody tells us, all the experts, all the, all the authorities say, you are very needy. You need this and you need that. And it needs just keep on building because you're so fragile and you're so dependent. You're so needy that you need to be in therapy all your life. And you need to be on your knees all the time, begging God to be nice to you because you have so many needs. What a depressing picture. So how do you uh, tell a young person who is just kind of getting their head around living that they need to find a purpose and they need to be needed? Like, how does someone become needed if they feel like, let's say they have no agency, they're just existing, you know, they're in square one? Yes. And because they're just existing, they are miserable. And they'll say, life stinks. <laughs> no, 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 it's not life. You haven't tasted life yet. Existence stinks if you're not making a difference. Yes, that's true. Absolutely true. When a person thinks that he has no purpose, he becomes suicidal. Why? Hang around for no reason. That goes against the grain of the human soul. For no reason, I will not exist for no reason. I can't do it. So what do we tell children, teenagers particularly, who are so idealistic, they're willing to do anything if they believe in it, giving up all their comforts, all their petty shtick. If you give them a purpose and a responsibility, they're fantastic. They're completely selfless, much more than adults. So <laughs> children need to be told, God created you because he needs you. You're not the needy one. Get up off your knees. Stop begging. Stop fighting for your rights. You don't need it, but God needs you. So find out what he needs and do it. You will have a life. I guess I've heard a lot of people say God doesn't need you, but not that he tolerates you, but he, he doesn't need you, but you should help him because it's the right thing to do. But it sounds like what you're saying is a bit different. Well, it's, it's a contradiction to say he doesn't need you, but you can help him. Help him in what? He doesn't need anything. Mm. So the main, you know, the main uh, slogan of Judaism is serve God with joy. But take it seriously. Are you serving God? Can you serve God if he needs nothing? Obviously not. If he needs nothing and you have needs, then you come first. 
then you're more important than God. So it deteriorates. Mm-hmm. Because the message is not valid, it doesn't, it doesn't ring with authority or with truth to say, you need God's help, you need God's protection. It's not true. And that's why it always deteriorates to, oh, I don't need God's protection. Whoa, you're going to go to hell. But if you're a saint, then you're going to go to heaven. They have to resort to reward and punishment because they, re- they really don't have an argument. So how should we relate to God? I guess I'm, I don't know, I'm still confused as to what the, to think here. The only re- way to relate to God is this is his creation. This is his idea. I had nothing to do with it, I promise you. <laughs> it was all his idea. It was all his purpose. It's all his need. So on the one hand, I have no needs. On the other hand, I can help God with his needs. That's a great deal. I can be helpful to God. He needs me. You don't have to threaten me. You don't have to bribe me. If I can do something for God, I'll do it, especially since I have nothing else to do because I have no needs. Okay. Hmm. It's just so simple that, it, that it, it's scary. <laughs> well, what, what, I mean, in your experience, what are God's needs then? What kinds of things does he need? The Ten Commandments. Basically, he needs us to make this world comfortable for him because he doesn't want to be in heaven. He wants to be on earth, but not a corrupt earth, not an earth in which he's not welcome. So our job is to make the world the kind of world that God can be proud of and God can be comfortable in. His kind of world. I mean, that is so obvious. If you say God created the world, what are you saying? That he's looking for something? He's yeah, sure, otherwise why would he create it? Yeah. Exactly. And if he created Earth, we are on Earth only to get off and get to heaven as quickly as possible. So why are we on Earth? It's a launching pad for getting to heaven? Doesn't look like. Looks more like a launching pad to get to hell. So what is going on? Life is not making sense. Even to children. Children are saying, I didn't ask to be born. What's going on here? Well, what's the answer? What will the parent say to a 10-year-old who says, I don't have to clean up my room. I didn't even ask to be born. Well, what do you say? I don't know. Have you heard that before? Oh, yeah. What do you say? It's becoming universal. Children all over the world are saying, I didn't ask to be born. None of this is my fault. And what happens is it immediately deteriorates to, well, then you're punished. Well, you, you have no explanation, so you resort to threat. You're grounded, you're punished, you're going to go to hell. God will punish you. That's just admitting defeat. It means you have nothing more to say, and the kid is right. He doesn't have to clean up his room because he didn't ask to be born. Oh, why wouldn't you just say, look, you're here, so deal with it. I'm here against my will, and now you're going to put jobs on me also? <laughs> mm. So what do you say to someone, that, you know, a kid that says that? Well, first of all, you have to answer the question. If you didn't ask to be born, then why are you here? Such a good question. Someone, your parents wanted you to be here, hopefully, at least. Or yes. they, you know, they, they didn't realize, uh, well, they realized, but they were like, ah, maybe it'll be okay. And whoops, you were born. I guess those are the two answers. Yeah. But when children say to the parents, I didn't ask to be born, the parents should be honest and say, neither did we. Who did ask to be born? Nobody. So what are you going to complain to Adam and Eve? They didn't ask for this either. Hmm. But how does that satisfy that complaint then? Oh. Is, is there a satisfactory answer to it? Yes, there is. A satisfactory answer is you're not here because you need to be here. You're here because someone needs you to be here. Two guesses as to who that someone is. You're, oh, okay. you're the creator. So you're right. You don't need to be here. What a relief that is. On the other hand, you're so necessary. So here's, here's the punchline, I guess. We've made the mistake of thinking we are needy. We're not. We are needed. And that's your choice in life. You can go through life pursuing your needs, which are not even real, or you can pursue the purpose for which you are needed, which is life, which is noble, which is incredibly exciting. The creator and master of the universe is depending on you. Wow. It's like, yeah, it's like those shows. We need your help. Like a superhero show, but it is empowering to hear that you know everyone listening is needed and they have some purpose and some role to play. And it's like that famous Kennedy line: "Ask not what your country can do for you; stop asking what God is going to do for you. God is the needy one, 
what can you do for him? Can you imagine if everyone in the world would wake up in the morning asking, what can I do for God? What an incredible place this would be. Yeah, it would be a much, much better place. Instead of being selfish and just, oh, I need that new purse. I need that new car. I need that whatever it is. Yeah. There's one, one other way of thinking about it. Those who believe that peace is possible, peace on earth, one of the arguments they make is, of course, we can all get along. Of course, we can all live in peace. After all, we have the same needs. Shouldn't that unite us? Shouldn't that bring us together? Don't we understand each other better because we all have the same needs? That oh, I guess it's that, it's that confusion. It's that, you know, being needy is probably what causes a lot of this angst instead of being useful. That's right. And understanding you're needed. Yes. We will never be united through our common needs. Our needs divide us. It's, it's like, it's so silly. Because we have a common need, that's why we don't get along. If everybody needed something different, we'd all get along fantastic. You go for what you need, I'll go for what I need. But no, we need the same dollar. We need the same city. We need the same block. We need the same food, the same air. So of course we're going to fight over it. I don't know. I don't know where that philosophy even came from. We're going to get together because we have common needs. That's what we're fighting about. Hmm. So what could bring us together? Not our needs, even if they are common to everyone. The only thing that brings us together is that we are all needed for the same purpose. Bring God down to earth. Don't go to heaven. That concept has done us no good whatsoever. In fact, is it kind of like uh, clean your room because God's coming over? Yes. Make sure it looks nice. Yeah. And it turns out that that is so much more natural. Like if it's lunchtime and you're home alone, you're going to make lunch? No, probably not. You'll eat some leftovers, you'll open a jar, or you'll just skip it because it's, it's too burdensome. But if somebody calls up and says, can I come over for lunch? It's a party. You'll cook up a storm. We would much rather serve others than be served. It's not, it's not noble. It's natural. We've been fed a lie. Put yourself first. Your needs come first. You have needs. Get, you have to have one of these. You have. I don't. I don't. Stop lying to me. I don't. I draw this picture. Our needs are becoming depressing. They really are. So I feel depressed. I feel heavy. I can't make a phone call. I can't get out of bed. So I go for therapy. What does the therapist tell me? In so many words, you don't know what needs you have. There are needs that are so repressed and so deep, you don't even know about them. So let's explore that for a couple of years until you realize how needy you really are. Mm. Thank you very much. I don't want to be needy. and I don't want to be very needy. So in desperation, I run off to religion. Maybe religion will take some of the pressure off. Maybe it'll be consoling. What do you find out when you go to religion? Oh, you think you have needs in this world? After you die, oh, your needs then become much more serious. Okay, I don't need to hear this. Is there any escape from my neediness? The answer is yes. God needs. <laughs> what a relief. You mean I don't have to be needy? No. You are needed. Now I'm alive. Hmm. Because it imbues you with a sense of purpose, no matter how limited or... And the need for maybe. purpose is so organic to the human being. It's not a religious thing, a spiritual thing, a noble thing. It's not even idealistic. It's just in our DNA. We were created purposeful, so we sent a need for purpose. It's our... Essence. Sounds like a good book title, Needed, Not Needy. Yes. By Rabbi Manus Friedman. Yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. It's it makes sense. It's revolutionary. It's, I think, also the future of psychology. So, for instance, in the course you did for women, is that, you know, right in the beginning, yeah. one of the, the topics that's discussed, is that, is that it imbue everything that you teach? Yeah, and that's, that's where I, I realized the importance of this. Because now I'm coming from a religious community where everybody is observant and everybody's keeping all the commandments without giving it a thought. Now I'm sitting down with a group of educated, intelligent young women who are not in the habit of following command. And I'm trying to inspire them to do it. Now, what can I possibly say to them? Whatever I said, they either disagreed with or found it very interesting, but unnecessary. Ten Commandments are great ideas. Who cares? The most popular response to everything I said was, yeah, but I don't need that. I don't need that. It's beautiful. Do it. 
I don't need it. And I'm trying to convince them that they do need it. And then I realize they are so right. They don't need it. You come up with these half-baked reasons. Oh, you need it for this reason, for that reason. They don't need it. The commandments are not our commandments. They're God's commandments. So who needs it? He does. It was so eye-opening. People who are not raised religious are thinking clearly. Who needs what? What's going on here? I don't. So if you look at a, a lot of people may be stuck in jobs they just don't like, you know, and they may feel useless, like, all right, I'm doing this for a paycheck. But other than that, I'm just a cog in a machine. So I guess that would contribute to them saying, all right, well, what I do in my daily life doesn't seem to have any impact. So therefore, I don't really have much of a purpose. So I'm going to get caught up in, I guess, what I need. I want a new TV. I want a this. I want a that. Maybe that'll give me satisfaction. But then I, I, saw, I also thought that. But then I discovered the people who have everything they need are the ones that are most likely to get depressed. And now we see yeah. it so clearly. The most popular, the most famous kill themselves. Why? Because all they have is an existence, which happens to be a very nice one. They've got a great existence. They have no life. Well, some of them go on to do charitable things or have organizations and all that. But yeah, those are the ones you hear about because they're not dead. Yes. And they, they haven't killed themselves in despair. Right. They realize all this fame is useless. Let me do something of value. And that is be needed. Find out hmm. who needs you and, and do it. And of course, it begins with the creator. Right at the beginning, you are needed by your creator. And as long as you're serving him, you serve your friends, you serve your community, you serve your country. But that's all in the serving mode. You got to get out of the needy mode. Well, what about for the people that, that do serve? You know, let's say you're a single mom and you're serving all the time. But, you know, there's that there's that argument. Well, what about you and what you need? You know, you're ignoring your own needs. And I, I mean, service is is vital. It's important. But. What if it's done to the point where there's no recognition, there's no thank you, there's no no nothing, and it turns from a, a good thing to something that drains you? What do you do then? Well, there's a difference between being exhausted or being disillusioned. Of course, mothers are always exhausted. It's very exhausting, but they don't become disillusioned. It's not they throw their hands up and say, why am I doing this? Who needs this? No. So yeah, they're, they can be exhausted, but they're not suffering from meaninglessness. But there are people who are mothers, and they do feel disillusioned because they thought being a mother would improve their existence. It doesn't. It ruins your existence. So you have to be ready to give up a little existence in order to have a life because they're incompatible. The more energy you put into your existence, the less you have for life. And the more energy you put into life, the less you need for your existence. I mean, a quick example, a doctor in the times of a plague doesn't get sick. Everybody's getting sick. The doctor doesn't get sick. Why is that? How is that? What, is he giving himself a better medicine than he's giving everybody else? The reason he doesn't get sick is because he's so alive. His contribution is so obvious, so urgent, so real, that he is so alive it protects him from the disease. When the plague is over, then the doctor might be in trouble. Then it all catches up with him and he crashes. But when you're fully alive, you don't need to eat as much. You don't need to sleep as much. You can skip meals. You can skip sleep. Doctors who are really inspired by the healing art can go without sleep. Other people cannot. So well, what do you do if you do a job and you help people, but you're not appreciated? You feel like no one appreciates you or they're like, all right, great. Just do more. You know, what there's, happens to you then? There's the catch. Are you doing it for appreciation, which would enhance your existence? Or are you doing it to be useful? If you're doing it to be useful, you don't get burnt out because you were too useful. You know, it's like if I give you compliments because I want a return compliment. And after five or six times and you don't return the compliment, I'm going to quit. So Right. But I mean, it's hard to do a job and just be totally selfless. Like, all right, I'm 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 needed. I'm helping, uh, you know. I, I would think everyone wants to be appreciated at least somewhat. Yeah, sure. We also want to eat, but we don't need it. <laughs> but when we're really busy, when we're really busy living, the need for existence becomes much softer or weaker. We can really do without. It's an amazing thing. So I guess you've you've taught this in the women's course. Do you is this a, a like a standalone course or thing that you teach to people because it's so important? Yes, I teach it to the women at Beis Khan. I teach it to the inmates in prisons. 
and I teach it to religious Jews who have turned Judaism into a religion which it was never meant to be. See, religion is a way to get to heaven. Isn't that true of all religions? Hmm. Okay, yeah. Judaism says, don't go to heaven. It's boring. Stay on earth and make a difference. It's not a religion. Huh. So I guess when you say, it, it makes me think of like a baseball game. You know, if you're on the field and stuff, that's down here on earth. And if you're, you know, you're in the clubhouse, that's heaven. You're not doing anything useful. You're not playing the game. You're just sitting and spectating. Yeah, in heaven, God takes care of you. On earth, you get to take care of God. Hmm, interesting. What kind of reactions do you get from people when you when you talk about this? When, when the light bulb goes on, what does that look like? What have you seen? Yeah, it's exactly like that. The light bulb goes on and you see it and you hear it. There's like that sigh of relief you lifted a burden off their shoulders, off their hearts. Now, how... you, uh, how do you see people change once they get this concept? I guess with anything, some hear it and like, oh, yeah, sounds great. And they go back to their existence. Some really take it up and change their lives. So like, what, what have you seen? Maybe a, you know, a cool or inspiring uh, story. I think it's more a matter of timing. It affects everybody. But how quickly can they implement it? Some people, it's a matter of years, three, four, five years, where the idea kind of percolates and matures. And then three, four years later, they actually start to serve God, fulfill the mitzvahs, keep kosher, keep Shabbat, put on tefillin. Some people, immediate, immediate. Like, why didn't you tell me this sooner? Why don't they teach this in school? And, and it's a good question. Why don't we teach this in school? In fact, why don't we teach anything about life in school? The only thing we're taught is about existence. Hmm. It's true, right? Go to go to school, get good grades, so you can this, so you can that, so you can get a job, so you can, yeah. It's yeah. all right. There's nothing ennobling about education. It's a preparation for greed and, and competition and passion. And there's nothing there that tells you to be noble. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've interviewed some people that I would consider real experts on you know, subject X, Y, or Z, but it doesn't bring them happiness. It actually brings a weight and a sadness is what I've seen. It's weird. It also doesn't bring morality. I mean, how shocking is it to find out that the college campuses are the most immoral segments of, of society? That, that should keep everyone awake at night. Higher education doesn't produce any morality, maybe even the opposite. It breeds immorality. It should be the scorecard, meaning it's an abject failure the way it's done. Yeah. So if you go to graduate school, you're going to be exceptionally evil. Like, what is this? It's really shocking. That's yeah. Well, that's true. A lot of educated people have committed, you know, terrible acts. You know, uneducated too. But uh, education doesn't really make the difference. It doesn't make people, like you said, right, moral or or just or noble. It makes them more dangerous because they're more intelligent, so they have more ways of expressing their evil. Like the Nazis, highly educated, brilliant people, finely organized with a sense of destiny and philosophy and, and all of it, absolute evil. Yeah. Killing people while whistling classical music. And the sad thing is it was all for naught. It's all gone, wiped away. You know, it's just not that, it, you know, it, it has meaning, but it's, it was all for naught. It's crazy. What was the point? The net negative on the world. No, I mean, what, I'm just going into the Nazis for a minute. I thought that, you know, what, what was the point of what they did? It, it was just a negative on the world. It, there was no point in doing it. The whole thing was a waste. Terrible. No, it's really interesting. Really, really interesting. The concepts that uh, that you've thought about and come up with. This alone can change the world overnight. We could have such a good world if people simply recognize that it's not about my need. It's not about my need. Not I can't have what I want. Not 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 I shouldn't have. I don't need what I think I need. It, that itself is liberating. But then, if I don't need to be here then what justifies my being here? And the answer is, you are needed here. Wow. Do people need to, okay, so when you say that, it's going to resonate with some people, but other people may need to say, well, what's an example? How am I needed particularly? What can I do? How am I supposed to help? What do you say to that? You know, in talking to the uh, inmates, they've never asked that question. They all seem to know immediately who needs them. What are some examples of what have inmates say about who needs them? One guy was actually classified as a predator. Not just your ordinary run-of-the-mill murderer. This guy was a predator. He was in solitary, not solitary, he was in uh, 
What is it called? What, the hole or solitary confinement? Or? No, 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 you can't do that for more than 24 hours. Isolation. He was in isolation for oh. 13 years of his 40 years in prison. Still in prison. But they kept him in isolation for 13 years because he was so dangerous to the other murderers. Yeah, so he took the course, the difference between living, existing, and he spoke for a, a gathering of inmates to encourage them to take the course. And something he said brought them all to tears. Here's what he said. All my life, I thought only of myself. Everything was about me, me and my problems, me and my success, me and my needs. And I had no respect for anybody. Well, that leads to violence. And here I am. But I thought my life was over and that I was now a useless creature. But I learned that only my existence has been damaged, not my life. Life means being of service, making a difference. He says, now, when I call my family, I have something to say. And then he said, and my children respect. And the whole place went, they melted. Can you imagine? You're a murderer. You're in jail for your life. And you managed to get your children's respect. People were yeah, it's amazing. Their tears. Murderers were wiping their tears. So the, the idea is so powerful because it's so simply true. We got it so backward. The creator of the entire universe needs nothing. I didn't create anything. I didn't even ask to be created. And I have needs. It's so crazy. So I don't know if someone, again, did something wrong to your family, let's say, you know, or you. How do you reconcile that with this new paradigm? You know, the, the, do you point out to the person? I mean, what do you say? Like, how do you get beyond that? That hurt, how does that influence your, your life? I'm not sure that I need to get over it. I'm not sure I need to become best friends with somebody who, who did severe damage to my family. Or I'm not advocating whitewashing all sin and crime. I'm just saying that no matter how bad the crime is, which ruins your existence, you can't be allowed to live freely. You have to be incarcerated, which really restricts your existence, but that doesn't mean you don't have a life. So this guy, the predator, is now giving free haircuts to all the inmates. He's good at it. Now euphemistic haircuts, but real haircuts. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. And that's totally changed him, it sounds like. Yes. Wow. And just by distinguishing and recognizing the difference between living and existing. Your existence can be wonderful or it can be horrible. You can have all you need to eat and all you need to drink and the biggest house and all the property and all the independence, or you can be completely destitute. You don't have enough to eat. You don't have enough to drink. You don't have a house to protect you, but that's all existence. So we're told all the time that rich or poor, you have to give charity. Charity is not a rich person's mitzvah. Everyone has to give charity, even poor people. Why? Because everyone needs to have a life. So if you're poor, it means your existence is pretty depressing. And that's why you shouldn't have a life. Get a life. So, so when you say, you know, get a life, does that mean, well, I guess a, a cheesy way is like, find your purpose. You know, what's a more direct way, you know, be useful. How? How do you do that? What if someone says, how? What do I do? How? If you have a spare quarter, give it to someone who doesn't. Make a difference. That's a very obvious contribution. We always call it giving charity as a contribution. But calling somebody and telling him that you're thinking about him and wondering how he's doing, that's a contribution. That's true, yeah. Here, here's the exciting idea. If, in fact, God needs his world perfected, what we call tikkun olam, if he needs this world perfected, it turns out we're all serving God almost all the time. Because if you go to work in an assembly line, and you help put together a car that helps a person get to where he needs to go and makes his life more livable, guess who you're serving? Yeah, you're serving God. It makes sense. Yeah. So I use this analogy. Imagine there's this Japanese gardener who just loves gardening. He loves flowers. He loves beauty. He loves, and he sees this neglected piece of property. So he just goes over there and starts planting and weeding and cleans it up and makes it into a beautiful garden. And then suddenly some guy comes over to him and hands him a check. He says, what is this? He says, that piece of property you just made beautiful, it's my property. So I owe you. We think we're going to work to make a living, to support my family, to make a better society. You realize whose society you're improving? You realize whose lawn you just made beautiful? God owes you. You invented the electric toothbrush. 
You're going straight to heaven. You're serving God. Now, how do you avoid this sense of like, all right, God, I, I'm helping you out. I'm doing this, that, and the other. I want something in return. Does that come up? No. <laughs> Once you know you're needed, you're not going to go back to being needy. You're done with that. That's too depressing. On the contrary, you're, you're almost hoping and begging and praying that God doesn't run out of need. Interesting. Because if he don't need, it's all over. Yeah, true. So, I mean, if you look back through the totality of human history and a lot of bad stuff that happened, there's been a lot of good stuff that's happened, but a lot of bad. What does that say to you if you look back at it, you know, in the events of today? What, what does that tell you about people and about where we're headed, if we're headed anywhere? And So, you know, the famous expression, I hate when that happens. I hate yep. when that happens. It's very funny because... Why would I hate it? It's not my world. Ugly things going on in this world, and I'm upset. It's not my world, and yet it does bother me. Well, imagine how much it bothers the Creator. So instead of freaking out about how evil it is, think about how desperately God needs that evil corrected, redeemed, or eliminated. Let's not put our response, our feelings, our sensitivities before the Creator of the world's sensitivities, needs, and opinion. So if the world looks really, really evil, wow, God needs a lot of help. Okay. But, you know, our tendency is to say, God, why aren't you fixing it? You're right. God, fix it. Yeah, well, then he doesn't need me, does he? He can't fix it without transforming the whole world into a different kind of world. He created a world with free choice for a reason. What about prayer? Should you pray? What should you ask for? Does it matter? You should ask to succeed in serving him perfectly. So when I ask him for bread and for health and for wisdom, what do I need the bread for and what do I need the health for and what do I need the wisdom for? for so you can continue to help him out yeah, and do good yes. in the world. To do what I'm needed for. For whatever reason, God created a world with free choice, which means people can be very good, people can be very bad. But when people act very bad, we turn to God and say, Stop him! What do you mean, stop him? Take away his freedom of choice? Right, yeah. Change the whole nature of the planet? The whole nature of the planet is people with free choice should choose the right. Not be forced. There are people who still haven't chosen life. Then all the good people in the world have an obligation to educate, to inspire, and to correct what's wrong in this world. Like I hire you to do the dishes in the back of my restaurant. You say, oh, great. I love a job. Then you walk into the back of the kitchen and you say, whoa, these plates are dirty. Well, yeah, that's what I'm hiring you for. This world is so disgusting. So get to work. Makes sense. So, you know, you taught this to inmates, you taught this, continue to teach this to the women's group. What about, uh, you know, listeners that want to take this course? Is it a formal course they could take somewhere or how would they get access to it? Yeah, it's not a formal course. It's just everything we talk about. That's the theme. That's the topic. And we have these conversations weekly, Sunday night, Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday night. And we talk about all the ways that this affects life. Almost every issue in life comes back to living or existing. Like the mission of death. Nobody knows what death is because the soul doesn't die. It can't. Life doesn't die. It's an oxymoron. So a living being cannot die, just like a dead thing can't live. So the soul, which is alive, can't die. The body was never alive. It's from dust to dust. So what died? What does death mean? I guess a, a soul inhabiting a, a body and then the soul doesn't inhabit the body anymore. Yes. So what is the difference? So we're like living Airbnbs for our souls and we have to check out at some time? Yes. And the difference is while you're in a body, you have to exist. Take up space, eat food, be protected, sleep well. That's all existence. What happens when a person dies? Their existence ends, not their life. And that's why people who have passed away are effective in changing the world more than while they're here. Well, some are, a lot are forgotten. But, but not by everybody. Every soul continues to have an effect even after it passes. Maybe only on his wife, maybe only on his children, maybe on one student that he had. But life doesn't just fade away. Existence does. Overnight, he went from needing to eat to never having to eat again. So what is, you don't understand what death is if you can't distinguish between existing and living. So people think your life ended. Life can't end. Only existence can start and stop. Okay. You know, one of the secrets of Jewish survival, this is really amazing. There were other nations, many, 
most of them not our friend, but they were very powerful. They ruled the world, each in their own turn, and they don't exist anymore. There are no Romans. There are no ancient Greeks. There are no Babylonians. There are no Egyptians. They're gone. There is no Ottoman Empire. There's no British Empire. There's no Soviet Union. They're gone. Jews, still here. Same people, same blood, same family, uninterrupted. What's the secret? Listen to this. The Romans, the Greeks, and the Babylonians wanted a better existence. That's all they wanted. A better existence means all property belongs to them. Every song has to be about me. Every conversation has to be about me. <laughs> existence out of control. All they wanted was to guarantee their continued existence. So they built these huge fortresses, these huge walled cities. They amassed great wealth and great armies to protect their existence. And all of a sudden, they just don't exist. Yeah, it's true. Our, our history has been the exact. Before we entered the promised land under Joshua, Moses, Moshe gave us a pep talk. You are about to enter the land of milk and honey, as God promised, and you're going to inherit the land. But don't get too comfortable, because it won't last long. This is what he said. You're going to get comfortable, but you're going to get thrown out. You're going to be scattered to the four corners of the earth. You're going to be diminished to a fraction of your number. You're going to be wandering from place to place. You won't belong anywhere. You won't be welcome anywhere. You won't know today what tomorrow will bring. You will go crazy from the chaos and the confusion. It just goes on and on for 10 pages. Right. The people must have said, is there a point to this? Why are you telling this? So Moshe says, what I'm trying to tell you is forget about existence. Forget about it. You are not going to have a good existence. You will not have a space of your own. You won't have what to eat. You won't have what to drink. You will not have security. You won't have your own property. No, forget about it. Be busy living. That's what we did. If you want to summarize all of Jewish history in one sentence, when our existence was at its worst, we were most alive. We produced the greatest scholars, the greatest social services, the greatest charity institutions. We were so alive, we barely exist. I mean, today we barely exist. We're still a tiny minority. We're still scattered all over the earth. And even Jews in Israel are told that it's not theirs. They have no right to it. So our existence is practically non-existent. But we're so alive that that's all anybody ever talks about is how much trouble the Jews are making. Yeah, adversity uh, gives people the incentive to do more than just exist. Yeah, and, and more than just incentive. Being needy is not true. So if you focus your whole life and your whole ambition on improving your existence, you're digging your own hole. But if you focus on living like the doctor during a time of a plague, so you eat less, so you sleep less, doesn't harm you. So because we're so devoted to being alive, we can tolerate miserable existence. Well, I thought if, you know, if there was no adversity, people really wouldn't do anything. Why would they need to? They would just sit around and just do nothing. If there was no adversity. Well, that, that's true, but that's not really ideal. The ideal is to do what is right without adversity, without external motivation internal. So for example, when the world does become perfect, and then there is no need to fix or correct or escape, will we still be good? Or will we just deteriorate into nothingness? No, then we will be even more alive, because we don't have to think about existence. So we can put all of our energy and all of our creativity into living properly. And we don't have to be distracted by yeah, but I need to eat right now. But when I got to get my sleep. I mean, it's one thing to, you know, to be purposeful and live a life like that. But if you're if you're trying to do that and you're serving under adversity, it just seems to eat at you. Or I don't know, it seems like it would. It would eat at you, pick at you. You know, I'm here helping doing this, that, and the other. But man, I'm hungry or I'm tired or, you know, no one seems to appreciate me. And it just seems like it picks at you. Because you're still feeling needy. Hey, what about me? Right. I mean, you can imagine a doctor is called in the middle of the night that a patient is in critical, and he said, oh, but I'm so tired. A real doctor never says that. His need to sleep has become completely meaningless to him. He's got to go and save a life. He doesn't even think of it as a sacrifice. He doesn't think of it as noble. 
But what was I supposed to do? Let the guy die? That's true. It's like many years ago, my son was at the McDonald's playground, you know, up like in the top of this tube structure and he got scared and he couldn't get out. So I had to go in and get him. And it, it was hot, claustrophobic. My knees hurt, my back hurt. And I went and got him and got him out. And a parent said, how'd you do that? I said, I had to. I can't leave him in there. It's my son, you know. And it didn't I guess cost, that's an example. It didn't cost you. It inspired you. Right. So this is the secret. The secret to our survival, which we have to share with the world. If you're going to worry about your existence, you're just going to make yourself sick. Mm. You're going to be on anti-anxiety pills. You're going to be on anti-depression pills. But if you're thrilled to be of service, you're going to live forever. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Rabbi, I've got a lot of wisdom in the hour plus we've spent. How can I direct people to hear more of, of your words and you know learn about needs versus being needed? It's good to know.org. Okay, so you have a schedule for when you do these talks and when you discuss these things? It's constant. Okay. Hundreds and hundreds of hours. So go on, it's good to know and pick your topic and enjoy. And I guess also YouTube, I mean, you're pretty prevalent there. So I subscribe to your channel and, you know, get to hear and experience you that way. So I guess that's another way people can do it too, right? Yeah, it's the same lecture. Okay. On Great. Facebook, everywhere. Okay. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, no, I appreciate you being here, Rabbi, and thank yeah. you very much for, for coming. It's been great. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at the good question podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit the good question podcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 